And why don't we go ahead and get started? As you know, I'm Robin Charlie. And the Adult Formation Committee asked me to do this. I had did this class several years ago as a result of a course I had taken at Emory. <clears throat> and I got really interested in the various depictions that uh, we see of Jesus or Marcus Ford distinguishes between the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Christ. And of course, we're going to look at both. But um, the, today, I'm going to do a little more of a uh, historical development of depictions of Jesus over the centuries, a little bit of art history, a little bit of theological history, that kind of thing. And then next week, we'll look at a lot more contemporary depictions. And the whole point of this is, how is this affecting how we relate to Jesus the Christ, if at all? Um, so I just wanted to start the conversation. Oops. Because we are surrounded by imagery, imagery of Jesus. Um, most of us who grew up in churches see pictures all over the place. We see them elsewhere. And they have an impact on us, whether we realize it or not. Um, as I said, I, I took this course when I was a Candler, and it really opened up for me things I hadn't even thought about. Um, that I, had, I needed to question my own imagery around the figure of Jesus and the Christ, and didn't even realize I needed to do that. So I'm hoping while we go th through what I'm going to show you, uh, we'll, we'll be able to think through some of this, and please feel free to offer your comments and questions. Now, a disclaimer, I am not an art expert, and I am not a theological expert, but these are just gleanings I've had and things I got from the course that I thought were really interesting that were impactful on me. Okay. Does it really matter how Jesus is portrayed? Do we care? I mean, we think of particularly Jesus the Christ as an overarching figure. Does it matter how we visualize him or how others do? I think it does, but as I said, we have conscious and unconscious reactions. And I love this phrase from the course I took, every image of Jesus or the Christ is a statement of faith. So we're gonna look at those, and what are they saying? What are we getting from these various ways of depicting Jesus? Um, so we're going to start with this one. That's what he looked like, right? <laughs> and I only make this joke because this picture is so very prevalent, and I don't want to denigrate any what's special to anybody. If this is meaningful to you, please forgive me. My concern is if this is the only way we think about Jesus. This picture, this painting was actually done in 1941 by Walter Salmon. He actually had developed it earlier than that. And by the end of the 20th century, half a billion copies had been distributed around the world. And that is why it's so ubiquitous. <coughs> and why people, we see particularly those of us who grew up in probably a more, I don't know, where the Catholic Church is used as much as the yes. Church. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So this is familiar to all of you? Yeah. Anyway, so that has been a very, very popular depiction of him. Very Caucasian looking, of course. And we will talk more about that as we look at other, other pictures. We do not have any copies of it at St. Mark's that I'm aware of. I have looked around, haven't seen it, haven't seen it hung up anywhere, so I think we're okay. So we're going to look at other depictions as well, but here's another example of why it was, it's really the same figure in these other pictures as well. I don't know where those are from. I got that from that class. In my opinion, a bit saccharine. You're laughing, Pete. Why? <laughs> it's a very personal thing. I really do, you know. But before we go to, yeah, that's really hard to see. We don't really know what he looked like. No pictures back in the first century, you know, no selfies and no drawings. <coughs> It's highly unlikely that anybody was drawing pictures of him during his ministry. Uh, these were peasants and part of a Jewish culture that frowned on imagery. And it wouldn't have, you know, unlikely to, have, even if there's a sketch somewhere, unlikely to have survived anyway. So every depiction we have of Jesus is the artist's um, imagination. And in the early years, 
I don't think they cared that much about actual depiction of what the man looked like. They were trying to say other things. This is one of the earliest images we know about from the third century. It's very hard to see. The raising of Lazarus, this was from Syria. But notice, if you can tell, that figure toward the top is supposed to be Jesus in sort of a toga thing with short hair. So that would have been more in keeping with what young men of that period would have looked like and been wearing. And so that kind of way of depicting Jesus in the context of the, of the culture of the time started very early on. I don't know what the guy with the table on his back is up to. I would love to know what that was about. It was supposed to be Lazarus being raised. Now here's uh, that we get um, a lot more pictures from the catacombs, and they tend in their early years to be very pastoral. Jesus says shepherd, and you can see Jesus with the sheep there. I don't know what the cauldron's about. Um, now one reason for this, there could be a variety, we don't really know. It could be the emphasis of the early church was more, much more on the pastoral side of Jesus. It could be in those years, Christianity was still illegal and dangerous, and so any depictions might be safer if it's one that could be of anything. You know, it does not that only Christians might identify with this particular depiction. Someone who wasn't Christian might not particularly read it that way. So these might have been safer ways of depicting him. And here's another one from the catacombs. And this is the one John and I found so interesting. That is a goat, isn't it? And remember the scriptural passage about separating the sheep from the goats. Well, apparently not in the view in the early church, or at least in these depictions. I find this very reassuring. So again, we have the shepherd with the animals and all the rest of that. And here's another one, another pastoral one. I don't know what the, don't those look like pipes of pan or something? I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a But all the you know depictions say that is Jesus. So, but again, notice young man, short hair, no beard, wearing a toga-like garment, more common to that period of the third or fourth century than it would have been in Jesus' time. Uh, because people depict Jesus in a way that I suppose is familiar to them, and they probably didn't really worry that much about accurate depictions. They're, they're trying to say other things. <clears throat> in addition to the pastoral Jesus, they've also discovered um, many that are depictions of the parables. So here you have uh, Jesus and the bleeding woman. Again, notice what he's wearing, and that is the garb of a philosopher and the short hair and the no beard. So that's an honored figure, but not how a peasant in first century Palestine would have looked. But again, that really was, I suppose, really the point. This is late third century. Remember, Christianity is still illegal still dangerous at this time, for the most part. And here you have uh, Christ with a woman at the well, again, the philosopher's garb. Is this uh, a tomb or is no, it? That's the well. No, but it was in a catacomb, right, in the catacombs. That's where they have found many of these. Pardon? That's what the wall was. Yes, yeah, so over there. Yeah. The yeah. Okay, so this far, Christianity is a bit dangerous and they're being careful, I suppose, you could say. And then during the fourth century, some major things happened, which shifted actually the way Jesus got portrayed. Um, in 313, the Edict of Milan legalized Christianity. This is Constantine. So it was no longer dangerous to be a Christian. Also something to keep in mind, um, Council of Nicaea, where we get the creed, was in 325, where there was 
more or less agreement on the nature of Jesus, among other things, right? Just something to keep in mind as we go forward. And by 380, Constantine had made Christianity the state religion, and that very much alters the way Christ Jesus in Christianity is portrayed. From being a pastoral, sort of very quiet, or not quiet, but a pastoral, when you say non-threatening religion that doesn't, you know, get it, want to get into trouble, to the state religion, and many scholars will argue that changed Christianity substantially from uh, the pastoral focus to a more military, magisterial focus. And this is uh, very early, again, in a, in a uh, catacomb, fourth century, Christ is eternal power. So you're no longer seeing the shepherd, you're seeing the king, if you will, or the almighty one. Now, other th another interesting thing about this particular image is scholars say that this depiction of Jesus with longish brown hair and a beard developed over the early centuries and became a sort of agreed upon way to depict Jesus. Recognizable, particularly if given a halo, then people knew you were painting Jesus. Not necessarily because they thought he looked that way, but it was just the accepted way to do it. Um, which may seem strange to modern viewers, but remember, this is a long time ago. And you can also see the kind of the cross behind in the halo. Mm -hmm. Yes. Walls. Yes. So yes. They were giving Jesus a fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. And here you start seeing Jesus, the regal one. This uh, here he's. This is 500 um, CE. And he's dressed like a Byzantine emperor here. And the purple is significant. That was for, for authority and that sort of thing. So you go from this, this pastoral Jesus to the Jesus with power. And here's one I think is particularly telling. Jesus is a warrior now. No longer the shepherd, but Jesus is warrior. And of course, he's holding the cross instead of a sword. And he's standing on the serpent. That's supposed to be Satan. I'm not sure what the lion, lion, conquering the lion, would mean. You know, these are very symbolic. I'm no art expert, and I think a lot of this we don't really know. But so this is by the sixth century. So holding between the gospel book down as the Yes. Yeah, holding the gospel. Yeah. It's interesting how he's holding the cross, isn't it? <coughs> Yeah, almost like a weapon, or I don't know. Like the, the burden is easy, the cross is. Easy. Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Just like now, here's one that will look familiar to you. Uh, we actually have a, a copy of this in the inner narthex on that little table as you're entering the nave. It's very well known. It is from the um, sixth century um, in Mount Sinai. One of the oldest known icons of Christ is a Pentaquator. I can't pronounce this, like Almighty One. Very common depiction of Jesus, and what's one of the not only because it's very old, but one of the really interesting things about this particular image is that it re really, the artist really tried to uh, portray Jesus as fully human and fully divine. So one side of the face looks more divine, the left side. The right side is the more human side. And he's holding the scripture, and the other hand is giving a blessing. I found this neat picture. Somebody photoshopped it so you could look at the different sides. Isn't that interesting? In the 6th century, the artist was able to do that. So it was a very famous, um, very famous icon. And again, you know, the branding is there with the dark hair and the beard. You know. okay. And the cross and the halo. Pardon? And the cross and the halo. Oh, definitely the halo, yes. So you, you have no doubt who it is. And here's another one, Christ in majesty with angels. 
uh, in a church this time, of course, because you're seeing a lot more Christian art because it's safe and popular and all the rest of that. But again, Christ uh, dressed in purple, magisterial, that sort of thing. I'm rather fond of this one. <laughs> this is from the Book of Kells, and for the 8th century, and uh, there's, it's very symbolic, so to 21st century eyes it looks very odd. But this is, of course, a Book of Kells, an illuminated, very elaborately illuminated manuscript, and the use of gold was considered holy. And here, Jesus, or the Christ, has white skin and blonde hair because those are marks of holiness. Not because the monk who did this thought he looked this way, but this was a mark of holiness. And uh, then you have all the elaborate symbolism around him. And, um, but again, now you're very much into uh, Christ in majesty with the purple clothing, again, and lots of gold. And again, he's still carrying scripture, which is interesting. I'm guessing that's what it is. Am I going too fast? So we've gotten from the pastoral Jesus to the Christ in majesty, all-powerful one, king, and many associate that with it becoming a state religion and getting much more patriarchal and uh, militant, if you will. But then during the Middle Ages, there was a shift, and I don't want to overstate this, I'm not an, I'm not an expert, but I'm up here, I get to speculate, right? <laughs> we now start focusing more on the suffering Jesus. Now, this is my theory, I haven't heard this from anyone, but uh, in the 11th century is when Anselm promoted the satisfaction theory of atonement where Jesus had to die for our sins and in order, in order to save us, uh, Cur Deus Homo was his famous book and that particular way of looking at the atonement um, was, has for some reason really hung on, particularly unfortunately in some Protestant churches, but I won't go into that, that's another whole class about it unless Bev would like us to update us on atonement theory, theology. But my theory is then you start seeing more pictures of the crucifixion and a suffering Jesus. Uh, another reason may be uh, when the Franciscans get, got going in the 12th century, much more of a focus on the poverty of Jesus, on the earthly connection and suffering of Jesus. So even art historians say you start seeing more depictions of the crucifixion and of a poor Jesus, and we're moving away from this very magisterial, uh, militant, kingly Jesus to a suffering Jesus. Also, think of the times. This, this was a hard, hard, um, brutal culture at the time, so it would be understandable that maybe people would connect more with a suffering Jesus. But you see in Christian art a lot more uh, depictions of the crucifixion and they start out fairly stylized if you will this is kind of interesting with the Jesus on the cross and again we know it's Jesus because of the halo and the hair and then you've got the uh, Mary and the disciple John on either side That's the 13th, 14th century, and now we're getting just a little more realistic. Again, another, I don't wanna to dwell too much on these. <laughs> and here's one from Belgium in the 15th century. You start seeing these in churches all over, and in art. Oh good, I'm glad that came out all right, it isn't too dark. Uh, this is a Titian, which is, Art was getting more representational, so you're not seeing as much symbolism, and you're getting a much more, if you will, realistic portrayal of the crucifixion. It's a lot more blood and pain and all the rest of that. Um, a 
zipping through this faster than I thought I would. You need to talk. What um, does the hair and the beard and his white body still mean associated with holiness, well, or do you think? One thing I read was um, we're still getting these depictions of Jesus with the dark hair and more Caucasian or European looking and all the rest of that because that had become sort of the accepted way of portraying Jesus and artists depended on their patrons, including the church, and so they didn't really want to go too far astray. That was one thing I read. I'll try to find a picture of it. Michelangelo did one that looked, where Jesus looked a little more like Apollo and it was very controversial. So, yes? When did um, the split between the Orthodox Christianity and Western Christianity? I knew somebody would ask that. Do you know that? I think it's the year 1000. I thought it was around there. Yeah. Well, was it for me? A lot of Because I wonder if there's like a, a different, I mean, there are iconic groups. Yes. And yes. Yes. Completely different. Yes. Much more symbolic, iconic, rather than, than portrayals like this. Yeah. She still seems to have the halo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is a little bit of a divergence, but not really. You start seeing, as I said, not only these depictions in art, but crucifixes in churches, whether it's crosses or handheld crucifixes. And so that sort of raises the question of, the, now today, um, they're all over you, particularly, of course, the Catholic Church relies on crucifixes, as does Orthodox. Um, Protestant churches generally do not. Uh, that would be the plain Protestant cross, and the reason being that the um, uh, Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, there was much anti, um, they didn't want, they didn't all like all the symbolism they associated with Popeism and Catholicism and all the and any kind of idolatry of objects and so on. So initially they didn't want any Protestant churches any kind of depictions at all and of, with Christian symbols, but eventually became acceptable to have a bear cross. Today, the argument is in the Protestant churches that you only use a bear cross, that is because Jesus is risen, he's no longer on the cross. And we, of course, being via media, tend to go both ways, right? And you can actually find crucifixes in Anglican churches and maybe some more Anglo-Catholic Episcopal churches, as well as bare crosses. And, we, and we're going to look around. We can do this more next week of what we have here at St. Bart's. And we actually have a little both. You know, we do not have... Well, I haven't found too much in the way of a standard crucifix. But we have some, some of Jesus on the cross, although we do have, of course, this over our altar. Although to me, that is Christus Victor, Christ in majesty, risen, because of the crown and he's got what? And the radiance? Yeah. Have you got a copy of the other side? The no, no. Does it? Uh, it's a crown of thorns and a drop of blood. Can remember what's on the other side of that cross. Um, anyway, we can see it when you walk around the church if you can look up there. But, but, <coughs> but um, it's it's more of a well, it's for Lent, it's not for right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just love the way we incorporate both. In I love way. this. Open I do too. I love cross. this with myself personally. The, the now I can remember of turning the cross on uh, Easter time. So we had the suffering on this. I didn't have reach and the Yeah, you turn it around. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, a, a practical change away from that has occurred. Because it's just it's just our heart. So <laughs> the people that, that have been turning it are getting older. <laughs> As we all are. Yeah. 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 So we experimented with covering it. This year, and so that seems to work better for the folks who are. So maybe we can find a way to reveal the other side. Well, the safest way involves three letters and three people. Wow. And three more people to hold the letters. Yeah. 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 yeah.
and, and they're looking at others and worry about them and wrap them out. <laughs> Raz, would you do me a favor? There is a cross with Christ on it just inside the nave where the ushers sit. Mm -hmm. Would you bring that? Yep. It is up there now. Um, and we can decide whether that's a Christ suffering or Christ. Um, I have looked around the church. I don't think there are many depictions of Jesus in the classrooms, particularly in the kids. Am I missing something? Okay. Because, um, Angel, we started out with that famous Walter Solomon, Jesus everybody has seen, but I've never seen it here, so. Um, one reason why the cross is, is heavier than ever is that Mac put that wood frame around it. Yes, uh, yes. It used to be bare. <laughs> because it was so small. Yeah, it didn't make much of an impact. It, it was framed out because I made it at least twice to You know where there is the image of the crucifixion? It's a painting. It's in the chapel. Oh, yes, yes, that one. I have a picture of that. I don't think I brought it. But you know the painting in the chapel where you look up and the, at the feet? You have to be the priest to be able to see it. I, I've been at, I was in that chapel for you years before I turned around. Yeah, but not if you're sitting up. I mean, I didn't even know it was a painting. Yeah, I, I find that really difficult to look at, although it's very powerful artistically. Yeah. Now, this is a fairly recent addition, I think. Do you know where it came from? Yes, it's uh, from Joan Payton in memory of the oh. Reverend Bill Payton. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, I, as I recall, it's Mexican art. I guess you can interpret it either way. I see it, there's a crown. I mean, there's a crown of thorns, but also here more of the halo or, you know, so it can either be, I don't know. A blending of both. A blending wow. of both. Wow. Maybe yeah. it's not binary. Yeah. What? Maybe it's, it's not, not binary. binary. <laughs> <laughs> it's very powerful. I, I found that. I struggle having been brought up Presbyterian and Methodist. You know, so we do, you know, we did blank crosses and that was it. And so I always have to work my way through having Jesus on the cross. So I will admit my bias, except I find that one very powerful. Yeah. I'm glad you knew the history of it. Yeah. I don't mind. It's got a date on it, right? Uh, no, it just got a, it's a gift from John Payton yeah. in memory of the Brother Bill Payton. That's all. I don't mind. Yes. You know, you're just, this is what I did for you because you yes. this is what you deserve. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> theologically speaking, um, as well as for crowd control, you might say, um, in the classrooms uh, as I was growing up, um, the crucifix is very useful for two things guilt and keeping children in line because look at what you suffered from you. You better behave and be good. Oh. The other thing is, look at him suffering. You have nothing to complain about. Oh. Right. And that is, um, well, I, I would say, you know, I'm 1945, I was born, but in the 50s, like growing up in the classroom, that really was the tool to do what you want them to do. So I think theologically, uh, as well as... She was raised by Ursuline then. She didn't mention that. Yeah. Well, I can say that the best book. These were the same joke in the early on. Yeah. First one of the values, you didn't have a cross in church. You had the pictures in Sunday school, but a cross in church was idolatry. Oh, even a blank cross. Yes. I kind of was. Well, Interesting. Now, some have them now, but that's what, yeah. what we had in our Baptist church. We had that above the baptismal in the um, stained glass. So that's kind of like a cross. Jesus 
with a very blonde hair and blue eyes was considered from homies. I had never heard that. Well, at least back in the 8th century. We're going to look at more of those, and forgive me, I didn't bring more of my pictures. I thought this would be enough for today. Um, of the very, very, if we will, Caucasian Jesus. I mean, we looked at the Solomon picture, but that was even before then. You know, that was what, through missionary work and so on, that was how Jesus was portrayed. And we need to think about what that meant yes. and the impact that had. And on our own imagination and own faith and own, own, own ideas of Jesus and how we relate to Jesus. Uh, the course I took was called Images of Christ, and it was very eye-opening for me personally. I had worked for a long time, you know, to get a move away from the God the Father imagery and to be much more open, and it hadn't occurred to me I, need to work, I needed to work through that around Jesus as well. Because I grew up in the churches, we'll go back for those who haven't been Sorry if this makes you dizzy. <laughs> that one. I personally grew up with this, and that was just Jesus, period. And he didn't question it, and it was never even a thought. And I, you know, didn't go to a particularly um, rigid churches. It just this was the way it was in the 50s. You know, people didn't question this kind of thing. And so here I am, a fully grown adult, uh, taking courses, realizing I had carried that imagery in my head all these years, and I needed to question it, and what the impact did that have on me? And so I started seeing other cultural depictions of Jesus, not as widespread as this one, but they certainly exist, and we will look at them next week, and it just absolutely opened up Jesus to me in ways that I didn't even realize I needed. Wait till I get started on Krista, which is the female no, representation no, of Jesus. That'll get him back. That'll get him back, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and next week? Yes, we'll do that next week, I promise. I and grew, a, I grew up in a, across the tunnel of the altar where the Episcopal Church I grew up, and he was dressed in the chasuble gown. I mean, he was like, oh, dressed like that. Priest. priest, sure. And they have the same cross at St. Columbus Church. As soon as I walked into St. Columbus the first time, I'm like, I haven't seen that cross since I was a child. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, he's got a crown, but the crown, is, I think, is so small. I, to me, the only thing I see is the chest. And I was like, I, just, I, I felt, it felt good to me because I felt at home there seeing that. But at the same time, it, it, it makes me think, you know, it's more than just being a king, it's being Servant, being priest. And then there's the depiction in St. Patrick's. I think yes. that's yes. it's lost. Like, yeah. Just, what is that? Just, it, you know, Victoria's coming out of the window. There's, there's no cross. There's no the, cross. The cross is the, is the window. Yeah. He's, mm -hmm. And he's literally suspended from the ceiling. That's a little creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so I urge you to think about this. You know, what have you been carrying around and you didn't even realize in terms of imagery of Jesus? Does it really matter, though, what he looked like? You know, our baptismal covenant... somewhere. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? The implication is seeing Christ in everyone. So how does that have an impact on the imagery? Yes. Um, this image I grew up with and I refer to as Malibu Jesus. <laughs> oh, I've got, a, I've got one or two that are worse. It is yeah. a very safe. Yes rendition of Jesus. At one point, I became very curious and interested in the pre-crucifixion Jesus to find out who that person was. And I think for me, it would be more helpful to see 
the Middle Eastern, or the Palestinian Jew, to help me see the world that he lived in and the situation from his point of view, rather than this very safe, clean, non-threatening Jesus. Because I suspect, for me, what that Palestinian Jew is all about threatens an awful lot of my comfort yeah. and asks me to um, become. This, this comforts me that I already am, that I don't have to do anything. Um, you know. So I, I think an image in that way would be more helpful to me. And there are some. But you're right. The, and so have, have other um, non-white uh, civilizations gone off in the direction of depicting Jesus in their own? Oh, yes. And well, I'll have a bunch of pictures next week. Yeah. There are um, black Jesus. I have a wonderful... Uh, what? I love... I have a, a wonderful guru Jesus... And uh, so there are lots of them, as well as I said, they're female depictions, not because anybody thought Jesus was a woman, but just theologically saying some different things. And um, yes, and of course, you know, the man Jesus didn't look like this. He was a Palestinian Jew. Men of that era, he probably wouldn't have had long hair for hygienic reasons, if nothing else. He probably would have had a beard. He would have been swarthy, you know. Homeland Security would have been suspicious of him. You know, and small. Marcus Borg thinks he probably wasn't more than about five feet tall. Because. Yes, I actually have another one with a blonde Jesus with blue eyes. Is that what? Oh, it just. Which I saw at a church near where I live. One of the things I think, in terms of how the images influence. Uh, what do we do with the images? I think knowing the story, like you're telling a bit of the story about what the, was the tradition of painting, painting a holy person right. in the four, first 400 years. I've had a really hard time with crucifixes over the years. The painting that's in the chapel, mm -hmm. when you look up at it, the story, as I understand it, I was here when it was given to the church. The person who painted that, his wife, and child had been killed. And he, I understand, had real significant um, mental health issues. And apparently, through painting that painting, it's, it's looking, we'll see it next week, what the sense of it, but it's looking up at the, at the cross from the foot of the cross and sees feet first, and it's, it's big. But he painting his way through the crucifixion and the suffering and the God suffering with us. Somehow he was able to integrate this loss into his life through that. So, and I remember a couple of Christians who'd been really sick in hospital, especially with Joseph. St. Joseph used to have the crosses in each room, crucifix, and suddenly making sense out of their, because of their own suffering, out of the cross. Or the crucifixion. So um, anyway, just to add that perspective to how any of these symbols can function. And like our kids are going to say, their main image of Jesus is from Camp Michael, which is this laughing Jesus. They're going to grow up with this um, historical uh, sort of depiction of Jesus laughing and hanging out with friends. Um, I don't want to um, minimize the importance of any of these images to individuals, and many will find, you know, the crucifix, the suffering Jesus, as really meaningful. And some of us find it too disturbing. It's just a very personal choice. There are some people who see a lot of holiness in this picture, with light coming behind him, and Solomon himself talks about being spiritually inspired by doing it. So we can laugh at it now, but you know there are many people who found it meaningful. My only goal is to get us to think a broader picture rather than just one image. 
and to think about the impact they have on us. And um, um, so we'll look at a lot of different ones next week, and some of them more controversial than others, and, um, and see how they can broaden our view or tell us things we hadn't thought about. Um, when I did this the last time, I have a picture of an angry Jesus, and that's the one that got the most a pushback. Somebody got really mad at me for using that one. Yeah. I was going to say that, um, you know, I'd be curious about depictions of Jesus as well. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, stories and, and videos online of people that have had either near-death experiences or have claimed to have experienced Jesus in a kind of a very personal way. And there are a lot of people that say that they can't see his face. Mm -hmm. That it's like just white. white. Ah. And, uh, or they, or in the dream, they never get to see his face. It's like he's there, but they never get to see his face. So I wonder, wow. I wonder why that is. I'm not sure. But there was one young girl who had near death experience. She was a child. She was a prodigy as a painter, and she painted very oh, right, right, right. detailed, I think light eyes, but dark. Yeah, and then of course we have the shroud in Turin and various other things like that. Which you, can, <laughs> you can debate quite a bit about any of that. But uh, was the Virgin Mary or Jesus image on a piece of bread? Where was that? Was that? <laughs> 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 what? What was to So we have to be careful. Okay, well, I'm sorry I didn't have more, but we got the conversation going. Think about it. If you have images you'd like to share or talk about, please bring them, and uh, we'll go from here next week. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Who should not be twisted all the funny, but the one depiction of Jesus with his hands like that? Oh. Is that common? Or is it rumor it's from Star Wars? <laughs> I don't know about that. No. Huh. It's Live long and prosper, yeah. <laughs> really? Huh. Uh, that's what they You've seen it? Yoga class that Star Wars is something like that. And I saw a picture of Jesus like that. And I wonder if it's repeated and and um, well, wasn't that the is orthodox blessing? That but it's, it, it's like this. Was it an image you saw here? It was an image I saw there. And my in my yoga class we're always using it. So maybe it's an Eastern Orthodox. I don't know, but I just noticed. Yeah. Experiential thing, and it's like we get in trouble when we sort of assume that's the only. I mean, I just have so much baggage with that picture, and then when he's surrounded by all the little children, and of course my childhood was very traumatic and difficult, and it was like, well, he loves everybody but me. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. So I mean, just. Um, but if I was to do a picture of Jesus today, it would be. It would be coming from deep within and it's from a good place. Oh, thank you. I find this a bit saccharine yeah. myself, but. Is this one here? Yeah. Can you grab it? The image of him is it's almost secondary the fact that his eyes are slightly looking up to his father's. Yeah, there's so that. It's that golden walk from the line over to the, <laughs> the piety and obedience in it. That was really compelling. <laughs> I shouldn't mock it. I know I shouldn't. But we feel like it's ours, those of us who grew up with it. So. <laughs> and I was quite shocked when I discovered really how relatively recent it was. I don't know why, but. <laughs> that was on the very first holy car that I got. Ah. There's a faithful film made in the Soviet Union in the late 40s called The Gospel of St. Anthony. And it's a black and white film. It's about almost two hours. It's a 
pretty good movie, actually. And it's very faithful to the scripture. And when it was brought over to the United States, the uh, you know, Motion Picture Review Board, which was dominated, I believe, at the time by the Roman Catholic Church, objected to it strenuously because it portrayed Christ as A, very angry and very powerfully angry, number one, and number two, and he looked like a Palestinian. Oh. <laughs> and he did. They, they, they cast a guy that looked like a real, you know, from the Lebanon. I mean, you know, just a guy, right? In stark contrast to uh, you know, this guy. Thank you, everybody. Right?